All right, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, who is uh, Patricia Delvin from the University of Michigan and Color Health, who will be speaking on mood lifters, a novel approach to mental wellness. Um, I don't know what's going on, but anyway, um, Patty is a uh, professor at the University of Michigan in the departments of psychology and psychiatry, and she's vice president of behavioral health at Color Health in Burlingham, California. Before going to Michigan, where she's been for, for many years now, actually, she was a professor at Harvard University. Patty received her bachelor's degree uh, in psychology from the University of Iowa and her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. For 15 years, uh, she held leadership roles at the University of Michigan Eisenberg Family Depression Center, which was the first uh, depression center of its kind in the country. First, she was associate director of that center and then uh, deputy director. She also helped to launch the National Network of Depression Centers as a founding board member. And she's had uh, another leadership role at the University of Michigan, where she was a director of clinical training for uh, a number of years. She's past president and past board member for this study for research in psychopathology. And um, I should also mention that in her role at Michigan, Patty has mentored uh, uh, now, I guess, several generations of um, students who've gone on to some really good careers as well. And so she's had a big influence on the field, both as a mentor, as a researcher, and as a leader. Uh, historically, her research has focused on transdiagnostic neural correlates of depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. Uh, more recently, her research program has focused on mood lifters, which we'll be hearing about today. And this is a mental wellness program about which she's published many articles and has more uh, on the way. Uh, she created this program with her students as a way to help people who cannot access traditional uh, depression treatment or who, will, who won't uh, access it, uh, really, not only in this country, but all over the world. And the idea is to help people get access to low-cost, effective, evidence-based mental health care. I've seen her speak about this before, and I was really impressed, and, and um, you know that was really one of the reasons I wanted to bring her here and, and have us you know, hear about it as a department. And it, I should say that in addition to uh, helping to create mood lifters, Patty also uh, has served as a leader, uh, a group leader for mood lifters, and also participated as a member. Okay, so that's enough from me. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Patty and um, let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Steve. Can you guys hear me now? Y'all can hear me, I assume? Okay. Um, I did wanna uh, give a COI notice. I am currently Vice President of Behavioral Health at Color Health, and I have financial interest in mood lifters, but that is not why I created it. Um, I started this around eight years ago, and I'll go into the details about that, but it's really pertinent right now because you're, as, you, as you know, it's, um, COVID is not the only epidemic we're going through. 86% of Americans will have a mental health challenge in their lifetime. And of course, you all know that this starts when people are young. And these conditions are chronic and episodic, which leads them to be the leading cause of days lived with disability, far as um, exceeding cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all other kinds of care, all other kinds of mental illness. And it's increasing, particularly among the youth. So you can see since the year 2010 and 12 to 17 year olds and 18 to 25 year olds, we have this dramatic increase in both depression as well as anxiety. Well, that's not surprising, right? Since we know that they're chronic and episodic, but what is surprising is that it's getting worse by generation. So with each successive cohort, you see the cumulative lifetime prevalence of just major depression, which is of course one of 257 illnesses is increasing by generation. And this is true for anxiety, as well as substance abuse and other kinds, other illnesses. So by the time people are in their early or late 20s, early 30s, you already have a 25% prevalence rate. 
And some people used to think, I don't think they do anymore, that this was simply a self-report bias. And it's true that young people feel much less stigma around mental health and mental health care, but you also see at the same time, a dramatic increase in suicide. So suicide rates in the United States has increased by 40% since the year 2000. And again, it's not just depression, though of course it's pretty shocking when you see these st statistics that the number one, um, cause of death for all people, or actually for people in this age group, are unintentional injuries, which could be car accidents and other kinds of things. But the number two cause of death in 10 to 14 year olds is suicide. To me, that is a shocking statistic. I just actually heard about a, a friend who had a nephew who died at the age of 10, just two days ago. And the sad part is all these in the colored boxes are behavioral and preventable. So they're in our domain. And I would say, given that data that I just showed you, that traditional methods of care that we have in the United States have failed to maintain mental health or improve mental health at a population level. Now, of course, the great care that you all provide on an individual basis, you're helping tons, thousands of people get better. But what I'm talking about is this whole population base. Now compare this to say cardiovascular disease or cancer and you see dramatic decreases. So what's the problem? Well, we have four main problems that are getting in the way of providing high quality care to everybody who needs it. And I call these the four A's. The four A's of living care are the affordability of care, availability of clinicians, accessibility to science-based care, and acceptability to constituents. And I'll go through each one briefly. Okay, so we say 86% of the population needs mental health care. It, and again, we already established that these are chronic and episodic. So most people who have it won't have it once. People who have one depressive episode, 75% of them are likely to have two or more. So if we treat just one episode of depression, I tend to talk about depression because it tends to be my area of expertise, but this is true across many other illnesses. Let's say the ideal uh, care is CBT for 15 to 20 sec sessions and about in that care, 50% uh, of people will get better, times that by 100, 200, $250,000, that could bring the total to at least $1,500 to $4,000 to be treated for one episode of care for one disorder. If we treated every single person who needed it with traditional care, we would break the healthcare system. Okay, so we did. We, take, we have enough money, we can provide care, theoretically. Well, the problem is there aren't enough providers. Right now, only 46% of people who need care seek care. And already with those numbers, we can't nearly come close to providing all the care that's needed. So if you look at this graph, this is the health professional shortage for mental health by county in 2017. And I, can th I think you guys are right around here, but this uh, light blue box is um, Washington County, which is where I live. And you see, supposedly we have no um, shortage in our area. All the dark have um, a whole county-wide shortage. And what you guys are in supposedly is a part of a county shortage area. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this seems kind of strange to me since what happens here, the biggest complaint I got as Associate or Deputy Director of the Depression Center is that we can't get people in. Our average wait time is six to three months. So even though supposedly we have enough care providers, we actually in reality can't see all the people that need help. Okay, so we get people in, we have enough money to pay for it, but the problem is the vast majority of people who get care do not receive care that is consistent with the American Psychological Association or APA guidelines. And without this standard of care, people are vulnerable to ineffective or even harmful treatment. I think bad care or care we don't know about is worse than getting no care at all, which is a pretty radical statement. So if it is the case that only 21% of people are receiving care consistent with APA guidelines and only 45% or so are getting care in the first place, that means only 8% of the people who need high quality care are actually getting it. 
Okay, so some people are turning to technology as a solution for this massive, overwhelming problem. The problem is there are hundreds of thousands of apps. Very few are evidence-based. And recently an article, I love these quotes from Popular Science in, in the year 2021, they are saying things like therapy apps are booming, but mental health experts have vetted few. Some of the advice offered by them are downright harmful. And basically that mental wellness apps are basically the wild west of therapy. And I recently in my team did a review of the actual therapy networks like Better Health and other ones. And most of those, we can find one actually that consistently reports high quality care in my standards in terms of um, evidence-based care and they show data that it's effective. So the vast majority of people, and there's hundreds of thousands of these, these kinds of opportunities for people, we don't know what's going on with them. Okay, so what happens to the other 55% of people? They don't even get care. The number, and I thought really when I started this, the number one problem was the affordability issue or maybe the availability issue, but the vast majority of people who don't get care for mental illness don't want to, either due to stigma or they want to fix it on their own or they don't even identify it as a problem. And again, this is the number one reason why people don't get mental health care. So this was bothering me. I'm sure it doesn't make any of you all feel good because I bet you're like me. You went in this field because you wanted to help people. You wanted to make a difference with your career. And, you know, as Steve said, I've been around a while for the last 30 years. I've been in psychology for 40 years as an undergrad till now. And what have I seen? What has happened during my time in the, as you heard, the very best places, I've been blessed and fortunate to be in leadership positions. And on my watch, and everyone else is in the field, things have gotten worse. This bothers me because again, I went into this field for a singular reason and that was to help people. And I bet a lot of you feel the same way. And again, you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you do great work and help people. But me as a researcher and thinking about it, again, I had been thinking about under the, under the um, lid, right? I've been thinking in a really neuroscience-y kind of dorsolello prefrontal cortex kind of way, sort of missing the big picture of all these kinds of problems. But one day <clears throat> I was um, teaching a course on innovation, uh, actually it's a workshop on innovation. It made me really think about how could we do this differently? What could we do to try to actually make a dent in this amazingly overwhelming problem that has these four different uh, things that need to be solved, the four A's. And it's a kind of a funny sort of aha moment. I was literally sitting in a Weight Watchers meeting. Uh, I'm sure you all have heard of Weight Watchers, but I bet you can't name your University of Rochester one, um, a weight loss program. You've all heard of Weight Watchers. And I was thinking to myself, I had just lost 35 pounds. They actually treat like right now in Weight Watchers, there's almost 5 million members. It's always ranked as the number one program. And it actually really worked. It worked for me. And it was really psychologically sophisticated. I thought to myself, why don't we have something like this for mental health? Again, because innovation is usually where you have um, the greatest innovation usually happens at the intersection of two fields. So I was thinking to myself, why don't we have something like this? sort of this business model perspective, this behavioral change model of Weight Watchers and build it for mental health instead. Could we actually do something like this? Could we borrow from the behavioral change model of Weight Watchers because they perfected it over the last 60 years and also the business model. Now at the time when I started this uh, about 10 years ago, there weren't all these apps and all these other things. So there wasn't anything out there like this. It was basically pharmacology companies. And I thought, could we start another uh, approach? I never thought in my a million years that I would be the CEO of a company. But what I did is, again, you'll see in a minute that I started a company following a long research program in order to try to make a dent in this, in this, uh, this amazing, overwhelming problem. So with Mood Lifters, we created an effective science-based, peer-led, scalable and affordable mental health program that has no wait lifts, and we hope through Color Health will be available in every county in the United States. And that program is called Mood Lifters. So what is Mood Lifters? 
Moodlifters is a rapidly scalable, affordable science-based program that can be led by peers or, uh, but is, or professionals, and it's a group mental wellness program. So basically the idea, as opposed to treating an illness, just like Weight Watchers doesn't treat an illness, though of course, when you lose weight, those illnesses, many illnesses like diabetes, cardiovascular disease will improve. That's the approach that we've taken with mood lifters. So what we say is we take people who are unwell and try to get them healthy and people who are already healthy, but maybe struggling with stressful life events to actually to thrive. And again, we wanted specifically to decrease depression, anxiety, and stress when we built it, as well as improve sleep, relationship, positive moods, and healthy behaviors. Now, I really, uh, we all know that um, mental illness has biopsychosocial causes and consequences, but most treatments are unidimensional. So you go to cognitive behavioral therapy, you talk about thought changing. You go to DBT, you really focus on emotions. You go in to see uh, your family practitioner and you get medications. And I really wanted this new form of therapy to have a biopsychosocial approach. I was also very interested in studying it or building a program that worked for everybody. Um, I, so I don't know about you, but when you do research and you can, um, it's really hard to recruit people with pure depression or something else. And I wanted a program that worked generally, like I said, that raised the general pond of mental wellness. So using RDOC um, and High Top Inform, we, this program cuts across disease states and healthy states. The only people we exclude from our program is people with current psychosis, um, active mania, or severe personality disorders. And the funny thing is I think it would probably work for them, but we've learned in the past that these people can disrupt the group for the rest of the members. So if any of you have been in Weight Watchers, this will sound really familiar to you. So what I did is I went off on a fellowship and I thought, what was it about Weight Watchers that worked so well for me? I mean, I know, I mean, it doesn't take a PhD to know that you, in order to lose weight, you need to move more and eat less, but that wasn't working for me. And I didn't need some registered dietitian to tell me that. I already knew that. What I needed was hope and support that I could actually do that. So at my Weight Watchers meeting, um, my leader was a real estate agent who had lost 175 pounds the fifth time she tried. That to me said, if she could do that, I could lose this 35 pounds of baby weight that I gained. Okay. So again, if someone would have been up there that had never had the problem telling me that I knew, needed to lose weight, it probably would have fallen on deaf ears because I know what to do. I just didn't have the pathway to do it. So that's why we chose to go with peer leaders. So the actual program of Weight Watchers is you go way in, you go to these meetings where you talk about eating better, and then you go home and practice it. Now, if I would have just went to the meetings and actually didn't do the activities or the program, I wouldn't lose weight. I know, because I'd done that for years, right? So I actually had to do activities. We know that that's true also in psychotherapy, right? We know the more people practice whatever orientation, whether it be psychoanalysis, psychodynamic, behavioral, whatever, the more people do between sessions, it's a stair-step function, the more they improve. So instead of weighing in, people check in um, with a mood measure online. They, um, again, we screen for uh, any kind of increasing problems like suicide or homicide or just their depression or anxiety or whatever getting worse. Then they meet for a minute and share their leader with their leader the weekly goals. And I'll tell you, this is for accountability. When I had to step on a scale in front of two people, it was very motivating to not eat that donut that week. Then again, in Weight Watchers, you go to a meeting with a group and then you have this peer leader explaining it to you about this eating less or, or moving more. And in our meetings, what we do is we cover biopsychosocial evidence-based topics. It's one hours a week run by the peer leader and a helper. And we talk about a new topic each week. And how I picked those topics, you'll see in a minute, um, was I looked across the literature, looked across the biopsychosocial literature and thought what has the most largest effect sizes and what could we build into this model that peers could actually help folks with. Then we do uh, points. And then these points are based on the weekly topic and they're personalized, they start where you're at. We don't have the same thing that everybody has to do. 
Just like in Weight Watchers, you don't have the same food you have to eat. And then you gain points for meeting your goals. So let me break that down. So these 15, we started with 15 meetings. It wasn't a, uh, sort of a magic number. We did know that around 15 is when you start seeing um, significant effects in CBT, but really it was, I wanted three meetings in each of these five topic areas. I wanted biological, cognitive, emotional behavior, and social topics. So for example, we cover sleep, exercise, diet, Mediterranean diet in the biological meetings and the cognitive meetings, we co cover pretty much CBT and some problem solving skills. In the emotional regulation uh, meetings, we cover DBT skills as well as positive psychology. Same with behavioral activation, I'm sorry, behavioral change is a combination of CBT and uh, positive psychology. And then of course we cover social. And of course, you know, we all know that social relationships both prevent and ameliorate and improve mental illness. But do you know that there's not a single evidence-based strategy for actually improving relationships in healthy adults or adults with significant psychopathology that we could find? There is some in seniors and of course, children. So I honestly, this is the weakest link in mood lifters because we didn't have an evidence-based literature to pull from. So what we did instead is we picked things that were sort of pieces of what we thought would help relationships, like making new friends or improving old relationships from learning how to apologize to learning how to forgive and things like that. Now the points, uh, this is for a couple of reasons, it's accountability and it's a gamification strategy. So each healthy behavior that they, they do in those five categories earns them a point. We set them a point category. And this was also challenging because unlike with medicine or other kinds, uh, basic medicine or other physiological um, techniques, there is no dosage information across any of the therapies that we do. How many cognitive restructurings are enough each week? How, many, uh, how much emotional regulation do you have to do? So what we did is we made an educated guess on what we thought, how many points people should do. Like we thought people should probably try to change their sleep every night, so they need seven points. And the other things we, we made guesses on. Um, and since then, we've of course looked at points and try to determine how much of each of these things people need to do to feel better. Okay, so the question, so how do we know if it works? Well, we did pre and post measures um, for all the all participants who've ever been in mood lifters. And we look at those five different areas. We also, if you remember, we have people check in. So we actually can track week by week um, measures of things that we care about, like how there's their sleep, how are the relationships, how's their negative mood and so on. Um, before I start, are there any basic questions about the program? I don't see if I can find a way to know that. So I'm just going to go on. Um, so the first thing we wanted to look at, we actually are doing a qualitative analysis of the uh, responses people have to the program, because at the end of each program, when we ask them to refill out the measures, we ask them to tell us what they thought of the program and well, as well as which meetings were the favorite and which meetings they thought were most helpful. And we're just starting a qualitative analysis of that. But this of course is my favorite and to me the best, but we have hundreds, probably close to a thousand of these kinds of testimonials. And what you can see here is that our people who've been in mood lifters often are failure, have failed. I don't, they're not failures. <laughs> the therapy has failed them. Um, and they um, come here after trying a bunch of other things. And Annie here, and these are all, you'll see them throughout the rest of the talk. These are all, uh, all exact quotes of what people said. And this program, in this case, she said, helped her more than any medication therapy or therapist or other method I've tried. I've tried a lot. So that's great to know the, how people feel about it, but does it work? And so how have we tested this? So around 2016, we started a pre-pilot in my lab where we each took turns running the group for seven of us. Um, and then we also were working on a writing. And so we, we could feel what it was like to be in the program. We could modify and edit things. Then we started a program in the fall of 2016. Um, and lo and behold, um, it was really stunning to me that about half the people in that pilot group completely remitted from moderate to severe illnesses. 
That gave us courage to continue on. We did about seven more pilot groups, each case learning from people as we went, um, what worked, what didn't work, what meetings were too long, too short, where were people not getting their points and so on. So then around 2018, 2018, we started our first randomized control trial where we looked at peer leaders, professional leaders, as well as weightless control. The peer leaders were a stay-at-home mom, an undergrad an engineer. Uh, the professionals were myself and two senior grad students who were also developing the program, and then a wait list, an inactive wait list. After that, we just finished actually in, I think it was December, our second RCT in which we looked at, um, again, active mood lifters versus a weight lift, with weight lift in graduate students. In the meantime, we have also developed a special population effectiveness trials, which I'll cover at the end, but overall we've run around 15 people in both commercial and research contexts. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is that first RCT that was uh, started in 2019. It was a small RCT. We were learning what we were doing. Again, we're in Ann Arbor, so it's a primarily white and highly educated. And it was ran people were randomized to peer professional waitlist groups. And what did we see? We saw significant decreases in depression and anxiety in the treatment versus the waitlist group. In fact, we saw people getting worse in both waitlist conditions. And by the way, I won't say anything that I say. Well, I'll say if it's statistically robust, I won't say that every time. I'll say if it's not, okay? So the things I'm saying are statistically true. And the most important thing for this model, and it's actually this sort of dirty little secret in therapy research is that if you do manalized care, there's about 80 studies that say that peers are equally effective to professionals in these kinds of cases. It's not the severe, it's not the complex cases that you all see, but in general, for general care, they're equally effective. And that's what we found for mood lifters. Mood lifters is highly manualized. I could hand you all a manual, you could run it tomorrow. The benefits though of peers is it's culturally diverse. So for example, we have a low income minority community next to Ann Arbor called Ypsilanti. We run groups there then in say housing areas. And then we hire people from those same housing areas to then go and administer more mood lifters groups. So it's very culturally sensitive and we have a much more diverse leadership, um, leaders of our groups. It's low cost. We charge around 12 to $15 a meeting. So $250 in total for 15 weeks of care. So using peers actually expands capacity. Right, So we now have 100 leaders who can run 15 groups each. Took them about six months. We have an extensive training and testing and certifying procedure. And it creates jobs. So everyone who worked at my company um, prior to my selling my company, which I'll get to in a minute, um, had, were peers. They identify as peers. I identify as a peer. Everyone who worked there had been through the program and found it successful. And that's true for all of our leaders and helpers. So we were hiring people who were not employed due to their chronic mental illness, usually anxiety and depression. Okay. Once we saw the results of that RCT in 2000, end of 2018, we thought, okay, now it's time to test commercial model. Because you all probably know that once things leave the ivory tower of the University of Rochester, University of Michigan, or Harvard, it tends to not work as well. So the whole idea of this model was try to get it to millions of people. So we wanted to start a company and that company was called Mood Lifters. And I was the CEO of that company. And we ran that company from the uh, early 2019 to the end of 2022. And so the next set of data I'm going to talk about was run uh, was in the company environment, and it was with peer leaders. And so we were doing an effectiveness trial with this commercial model. So we learned a lot from the last RC to this. We know for one that mood lifters works a lot better in people with moderate to severe severe illness. That surprised me. I really had built this as a sort of therapy light, but that's not actually how it works. So this is an adult effectiveness trial we call the real world, um, the real world study. And it's adult, pro. these are only adults 18 and above. And what we found here is if on the left, in the left chart, you can see this is depression with the PHQ-9 and on the right is GAD-7 and anxiety. 
the purple is pre and the blue is post. And what you see is, yeah, it works. It works in people with mild illness, but it works really well in people with moderate to severe illness, both for depression and anxiety. In fact, I want to know, again, our goal was to get about a 25% reduction um, because that's the gold standard to see if something works. I honestly would have been happy with about 12% improvement given that it's $12 a session. So what do we find? This is a little bit of complicated slide, so I'll go a little bit slower with it. So you see here that this is a change score. Um, this is so as people get more depressed, going this way, the starting score, this is how much they change. We were hoping for a 25% change, which is represented in this red box, 50% uh, would be here. And what you see here is in the mild, none to mild range, we're seeing about 25% uh, improvement. Once we get out here in a PHQ-9 of six or above, you're seeing 40 to 50% change. And that surprised me. So you can see from the RCT to that data, it actually improved when we were in the company. Now, since we know that it works best with people with moderate or severe illness, we wanna know how it worked. Again, the vast majority of people in our company are white people with, who are educated because we're in the um, Ann Arbor area, which is the most educated city in the country, um, one of them. And But what we find, because we have gone to other places, is that mood lifters works across populations. There are no significant differences in efficacy across these different populations. So it works for men and women, young adults, middle age, older adults, high school graduates, people with some college bachelor's degree, um, graduate degree, Black and African American actually has the largest effect size, but not statistically larger than the others. And then, of course, it works in white people. So once we saw that, um, we were like, uh, we had been approached by many organizations and said, hey, can you build a mood lifters for us? And I was very concerned because we had just done an internal study at the University of Michigan in our psychology department. And the vast majority of people who dropped out of um, graduate school um, were people with mental illness. And again, the vast majority of people in the country that drop out of undergrad also have um, mental illness. And we were interested in seniors. Um, and then I'm gonna also just discuss today bipolar disorder. We have other programs that I won't be talking about today, student athletes, um, children, teens, and caregivers. Um, and we are now building in at Color Health um, programs for cardio and, and cancer patients. So I will talk about these other programs now. So as I mentioned before, our second RCT was with graduate students and we knew already from our general data that it that mood lifters was highly um, impactful for this population. So this is everybody. This is just not the severe people. Um, so people in 22 to 32 year old, we had an N of about 37. We saw about 50% reductions in anxiety and depression, but we saw significant improvements. By the way, in all of our in all of our studies across every single measure that we're taking and that we've looked at so far. So you see here we have a large impact of mood lifters. Uh, again, blue is pre and purple is post. So then we thought, okay, let's do an RCT. And Nima Prakash did this study as a first year grad student. I want to give a shout out to her. Um, we did a 14 meeting program instead of 15, so we could fit it within a semester. Um, we changed out again because mood lifters is a module. We changed out a couple modules. We added imposter sim syndrome and then also relationship with advisor as meetings topics. The first thing we have this thing called UM Clinical Health, um, and we put that out within about a week. We had about 1,500 people. I, I don't know exact numbers, but I think it was like 1,500 people want to participate in our program. And also during COVID, um, we moved to online format and we tested that, of course. So online in person works equally well. And so we now run most of our groups online. And so this study was done online, whereas the first RCT was done in person. We included a one month follow up and also a six month follow up. And we just finished the data and collection in December. So we're waiting for that data to come in. So you're seeing it hot off the press. And don't worry about all the numbers. I'll just say 22 to 32 year olds, mostly women as usual, mostly um, women identifying. Vast majority were white, though we had a larger Asian population. Vast majority was straight. And what did we find? 
we found, okay, so this first graph is depression. This one is anxiety. This one is stress. The colored line is the active group. The weightless group is in the gray dotted lines. And what you see from uh, first thing is we had no difference at pre for any of those. We had a significant decrease in depression in anxiety, oops, sorry, and in stress. We also, what you also notice is grad school is hard. From the time one to time two, you see increases, though not significant in depression or stress, but was in anxiety, you see increases in symptoms. And what that means here is let's take anxiety because this was significant. Mood lifters actually prevent the, on, the worsening of anxiety, okay? So again, we had differences at post for all groups and we had differences within for all groups. And then this one was also significantly different. Though they, the actual waitlist participants increased everything across the board. But it also seems to last. So this again is first, uh, first dot is uh, pre, second is post, and then this is one month follow-up. Now, one pre was different from both of these in all cases. Post and one month were not different, but they of course were different from pre in depression and in anxiety, but you see a significant improvement in stress following one month. So whether or not we have, if we had a larger sample, I'm pretty sure those would be significant. So either, even if it wasn't, I was expecting a flat line or slightly increasing. We're finding that people who learn these skills and practice them over time, seem to be internalizing them and continue to get better following the end of the group. Okay, so then we want to look at undergraduate age because again, that's huge. Our, I don't know about you, but our healthcare systems are overflowing here, like our site clinic with people. So we want to look at the 18 to 22 year olds within our general population. And again, they actually had more than a 50% reduction with an N of 45 in both depression and anxiety. Again, significant improvements across the board. We're about to start an RCT uh, looking at this in undergraduates um, at the University of Michigan. And the cool thing is we've also just run a course. One of my colleagues um, does this called project outreach course and is training undergrads to um, actually administer it. So we have about hundred undergrads trained and can offer this to other undergrads with supervision, of course, and uh, extensive training. Um, and in fact, they could like say, we could train resident assistants or other people to offer it because it does seem to prevent illnesses across the board to all freshmen. We haven't done that yet, I'm trying to talk to the powers that be, but at least we know that probably it will work, but we will first do an RCT to make sure that again, works better than um, a waitlist condition. And then one of my colleagues came up to me and said, hey, Pat, I've been seeing this data. His name is Dr. Scott Roberts. He's a clinical psychologist, a business professor, Dr. Ann Harrington, and a geriatric psychologist, Dr. Suzanne Maxner, wanted to build a senior version because they're all geriatric specialists. So they created a mood lifters program specifically for age 65 and above. Uh, several pilots so far with very good results. And there are some logistical challenges. They do not like it online. They only want to meet in person. Um, and we are, I just actually finished running a group myself and it was really pretty amazing. They, they got a lot out of it in person because their number one negative emotion in my group was loneliness. So this group peer led group, um, program was really helpful, but we do know that it works. So we know that again, even with seniors, um, this is a study done by them. Um, they again, saw significant reductions, um, in depression, anxiety, and this is, um, across all populations. And again, with their follow-up, which I believe was about one month, but I couldn't, I could be wrong about that. I think it was, um, and they also found that the um, results maintained. Okay, this was my biggest surprise. I was run, I was literally running one of the um, RCT groups in the first um, RCT. And one of my participants came up to me, because you remember we allow, we don't allow people who are currently actively manic, but we allow people with bipolar disorder in our program. And she walked up to me and she said, you know, Patty, I just have to, because we check everyone out. And you know, at the end, we go through how did it go? We give them their own individualized feedback. And I said, well, how did it work for you? And she's like, oh my God, it worked really well. This is the sta most stable I've been since my diagnosis of bipolar disorder. 
20 years before. And I looked at her and I must have had this, you know, like me, I was like, really? Like I was so surprised. Because again, I was thinking of this at that time as therapy light, right? I didn't think it would actually help, probably help in this significant way people with depression who had bipolar disorder. And lo and behold, we have found in the self-diagnosed uh, or at least self-reported diagnosed people with bipolar disorder, that it has a significant improvement with both anxiety and depression. Of course, now we are now uh, running people who are diagnosed with um, bipolar disorder to see if these results may, are maintained. Now, when we created this, remember I told you 15 meetings wasn't magic. In fact, I wanted it to be more like a model of mood, uh, Weight Watchers where you can go in and get care at any point in time. Like you could today go join a meeting. But here we still had to build groups and had groups of 15. We stopped at 15 because I wanted three of each and I wanted to start testing it. But my dream is for it to continue on forever that people can literally go as soon as possible. And actually we're starting a trial of what's called mood lifters now at our, low, at our, psych, our training clinic. Instead of like everyone starts at meeting one and goes through meeting 15 together, what we call a closed group, we're gonna try an open group. I'm a little worried about efficacy here because what we have found is that what people really appreciate about mood lifters is their leader and the other members. So other people matter. They like it better than support groups because we give them activities and actually act um, and actual activities and things to do that we know work. But um, to them, it was really the group thing. So we're worried about this. So the way this is going to work is we're going to do like on a loop our first eight meetings, and we are going to select those that we think are the most impactful, like a CBT meeting, a sleep meeting, things like that. And then what we're gonna do is just loop that. So in this, it's called Mary A. Rackham Clinic. We're gonna just, we have a leader, actually Nima, who I showed you before, is gonna be running eight meetings just over and over. So as people come, they can join that meeting this week. But perhaps Steve comes on meeting one, he joins number one. I come three weeks later and I start at meeting three. He ends at meeting eight, I end up meeting two. So it's discontinuous. And then after that, so, uh, so I'm participant B, Steve is participant A and so on. And again, they're looking at this as a weightless op option for them. They are getting inundated. They wanna, they're getting pressure from the university to, to provide care right away. And they don't have the capacity to do that. So they actually wanted mood lifters. They contact and said, can we do your program, but instantly. So this is the model that we are trying to test and actually it fits with what we had originally wanted to do. So I'll let you know, we're gonna start that in um, this year, hopefully. Like I said, I'm a little bit worried because this is gonna be an open group and it seems like the group cohesion might matter. Um, but anyway, so we'll let you know. So we are pretty excited about this. We think we have some solutions for some of the four A's. Um, it might be a suitable adjunct for intervention at universities to help with the mental health care crisis. And I think in order to actually solve this problem, you need to solve all four problems at once. And I think we kind of do it again. This is not for everybody. This is for those people who won't or can't get other care. Of course, if they can go to you as individuals, that probably would be better. So what do we see here? We see that um, we have a program that's affordable. It's around $15 per session. We're able to run these. We actually expand capacity. We actually increase the number of clinicians or leaders in our case with peer led groups and we can increase capacity because it is a group with 15 members each. We can run it virtually or in person and eventually eliminating wait lists and availability issues, um, at least for this group care. Everything about mood lifters is evidence-based. Like I said, I cherry picked what I thought was the very best out there. And of course we're testing the heck out of it. So um, we're only using evidence-based strategy and we're finding significant improvements. We are able to look at the number of points and at which meetings are working, we can switch them out, put new evidence-based strategies if they become larger effect sizes. And again, you saw acceptability by constituents. We meet in neutral territories led by peers. We have people who said, "I, you saved my life. I would never have come if it had not been at the YMCA where I already feel safe. We don't offer it in psychiatry or psychology departments except for the Mary Clinic. We'll see how that goes. Um, and we also think that we have a more diverse, culturally sensitive and emp empathetic audience because they're coming from the same community that they have um, learned um, it in. 
So I want to thank you. Um, this, of course, takes tons of people. There's about 40 people who've worked on this project from other faculty. We have on about 10 other faculty working on these other versions, like the kid version and so forth. Uh, lots of amazingly brilliant students. And of course, our participants, we've had support from many people and funding for many people, particularly the University of Michigan Depression Center and Athletes Brain Health Foundation funded the athlete, the student athlete version. That's it. Well, thank you, Patty. First of all, that was great. <clears throat> and it's great to see the, uh, the, you know, how things have developed since the last time, because I, I thought the last presentation was very impressive and now it's several years later. So this is great. Um, we have a few questions um, from people on Zoom and maybe from in the audience, but I did want to ask you myself, how does somebody find a group? Oh, let me just try to stop, stop sharing. I don't want to stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? It's not letting me. Yeah, if you can, um, thank you, okay. Um, how do people find groups? Um, it depends. Um, the best, so far those 1500 people, uh, the research studies we've um, done through um, like just the regular recruitment strategies that we use that everyone uses, but the rest have been word of mouth actually. So for example, a mom will take it. She'll recommend her daughter to take it. Who'll recommend her son to take it. Then one of them might become a leader. Um, we have uh, recently had uh, a person take one of our groups, brought it to the, uh, the president of a local hospital who then offered it there. And then someone took the group and donated $20,000 so that other people could take the group. We had therapists recommend people. They, I gave a talk. They then go through the groups themselves and now recommend people and donate to a for-profit company because they realize what we're trying to do is get this care out to people. So actually up until this point, it's been word of mouth and regular research. Uh, people go in it and they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. I want people I know to have it. Okay, thanks. So one of the questions from our um, virtual audience is, how do you screen people out? Uh, the, the people you mentioned, for example, with uh, bipolar, well, schizophrenia, let's say, or severe personality disorders, how is that done? In the pre-testing, we, uh, uh, we do different uh, measures to look at psychosis. Um, I'm blanking right now on the names of the psychosis and the mania scales. And then if they uh, score high in them, they're individually screened. Uh, by me or other clinicians to see if they're appropriate for the group. So they do that online, uh, pre-screening and um, pre-testing, and then we follow up. Okay, next question. Um, what are the training hours for uh, to be a peer educator or the amount of supervision for the peers? Sure, so the, it's actually the longest interview process probably anywhere. So the, how this works generally, um, is like Weight Watchers, all those people who lead are peer leaders. They've been through the program, been successful. So that's where we start too. So let's say, Steve, you want to be a peer leader, even though you have a PhD. You go with a group, you find it successful. Great. Your leader identifies you as someone who has what we call the common factor characteristics, which you know are warmth, kindness, genuineness, and those kinds of things. So they actually evaluate each participant on those criteria. So they've now met them for 15 weeks. Then we invite them to uh, be a leader. If they choose to become a leader, they go through an eight hour online certification in which they, we teach them more about the content, but then we also do videotapes of them and evaluate their clinical skills based on difficult clients. We also teach them um, very similar to mental health first aid, how to identify and refer people who are too severe for mood lifters and for their care. So if someone comes in and they're increasingly suicidal, or one time we had someone with severe borderline personality disorder was disrupting groups, they learn to identify that and get help. Um, and then we strategize about what to do. And again, they learn emergency protocols. And then um, after that, they become a helper with a trained leader. So you, Steve, would say, I'm leading a group. You'd come in and observe for five sessions what I'm doing, and then we co-lead, and then you lead for the last five sessions. So co-observing, co-lead, lead. And then 
<laughs> then after that, so now we've seen you for 30 sessions plus eight, plus eight hours online. Then you lead with me helping you. So again, I'm watching you for 15 sessions. Um, and each, in, so that's 45 hours of training. But then within each um, meeting, we have fidelity assessments. So the reason we have two people in the room other than emergency is so that they're evaluating each other. So I will, So once you're on there and you're leading, you, I will evaluate you on, did you follow the manual? Did you do anything outside the manual? Were you kind and warm and open to your participants? Um, so that's another way. And then we ask, again, if that's not enough, we ask participants to, to evaluate their leader every week on one question. It'll be different each week. Is it warm? You feel respected? You feel cared about? Those kind of things. So it's actually much I, you know, I was the director of clinical training for years here and I taught basic clinical skills and this is more extensive. Wow, okay. So we only have a couple minutes left and there are eight questions. Obviously we're not gonna get to them. So we'll email them to you and sure. hopefully you'll answer them. But let me see if I can get through one other one or two of these. So one is how can new groups get started in communities who don't have access yet to this? Well, what we do is we, again, we're on Zoom. So we could, let's say you guys wanted to start one there. Um, we could run it first. So we go into communities. There's two ways we now sell this, sell. Um, one is that we go into like schools or other communities and we have the helper or leader, uh, helper and leader. Um, other times what we're doing, if you're planning to run it yourself, like we're planning to run at the Mary Rackham Clinic, uh, we train people within the system. They go to one of our groups and then we follow, and they actually help and lead in our groups, and then we send them back to their own community. Another one is what we call hybrid, was that say we have people come into our, our meetings, um, and then we'll go and work one of our, our leaders and helpers will work with one of theirs, and so then they can then bring it to them. Eventually, they can run it on their own. This is different than Weight Watchers. I don't have 50 years to build this program out, which they did. So what we can do now is we actually um, train people like YMCA leaders, or uh, we're look, working with a community mental health where we're training their staff so that they can offer this on their own. It's a much more cost-effective for their own leaders and helpers to do it. Okay. And uh, in less than 30 seconds, can you talk about your experiences with adolescent participants? Um, we're just in the building stage. The KIT program is almost through all the testing and it works as well. The teens is what we get asked for the most and is the one that has failed so far. <laughs> teens, not because of the program itself, we can't get people to join. Uh, young people need it the most and we've been offering it through high schools, which I think is a mistake. We're gonna try it through a YMCA because they, they come if they're made to come and then they don't talk because it's a group setting because they're worried about you know confidentiality and being bullied and things like that. So, so far we, we don't have a great model. I shouldn't say it. we have a great model. We've only tested a couple of times and it's our weakest link, to be honest. Every other group has worked beautifully, like the data you saw, yes. um, except for this group. And it's gonna be a challenge. Okay. Um, let's stop there. Okay. Strain myself from asking another question or making a comment. We'll send you some uh, additional questions and then we'll pass on the answers to the uh, people who asked them. Um, so first, Patty, I wanna thank you for doing this. I know you got a lot going on right now. Um, really glad you were able to do it. Um, and you know, it was, uh, it's really great. I hope we actually can get something like this uh, or you know, this happening here in this area. Well, that's like I said, I'm working with a bipolar clinic here in psychiatry because they're overwhelmed. They have about 3,000 people on their wait list. And we're hoping that uh, I've built a model now. I didn't have time to go through where we put this as the wait list and get people in. It might be the only care that some people need. So if you're ever interested in having me talk to you guys about that particular way of incorporating it, I'm working on models, both at the Mary Clinic and the psychiatry department. Okay. Nice care. I'm happy to come and talk or at least via Zoom. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm sorry I didn't get to see you all. I hope to meet you at some point. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Patty. Mm -hmm.